everyone. Welcome to the Connecticut State Library. Uh, I'm Gail Hurley, director of the Connecticut Digital Newspaper Project, here with our project coordinator, Chris Gavro. And we're very happy today to have our Connecticut State Library outreach librarian, Robert Kinney, come and speak to you today about episodes in Connecticut African American history. What newly digitized newspapers tell us. Thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Gail, for introducing me. Um, of course, my name is Robert Kinney. I'm the Outreach Services Librarian here at the State Library. And again, welcome to our special program today, um, Episodes in Connecticut African American History, 1880 to 1949, what newly digitized newspapers tell us. Um, when you hear of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is Rosa Parks, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Emmett Till. Uh, we think about the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And these were all monumental events that occurred throughout the civil rights movement during the 60s. And most of this activity took place well below the Mason-Dixon line, which is considered the South. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna share with you some things that was happening here in the North in terms of the movement for equality for African-Americans in Connecticut well before the 60s. And, um, and they were all covered by historic newspapers. And historian Thomas Sergu's 2008 book, Sweet Land of Liberty, he reminds us that as a battleground in the struggle for civil rights, the North mattered enormously. Um, the quest for racial equality in states from Illinois to New York was an intense Northern struggle that deferred from and was inspired by the fight down South. From the defeat of Reconstruction forward, African-American leaders and activists in the North in general, and in Connecticut in particular, were well organized. Uh, when you look at, back at some of the historic press, uh, the black newspapers that covered the movement here in the North, uh, it gives us an interesting perspective as to what was actually happening following Reconstruction up until the end of World War II. The black press originated organized Gilded Age tours by figures like Ida B. Wells, who was born into slavery and one of the founders of the NAACP to come speak about the need to abolish lynchings and Jim Crow laws in the South. Um, here we learned that in 1900, about 1,000 people gathered in New Haven, Connecticut, under the auspices of the YMCA to hear Ida B. Wells and watch her stereo octagon slides of lynchings that took place throughout the South. Her meeting was covered by the German Choir, which was a black newspaper out of New Haven on Monday, March 12, 1900. For generations, the North has had the perception of being a place for being less racially biased than the South, and for being a better place for African Americans to live, especially after Reconstruction ended in 1876. In the South, after the Reconstruction period, Jim Crow laws were established which enforced lynchings and brutality which led to millions of blacks fleeing the North, which led to what was called the Great Migration of African Americans migrating to the North. While the North has had no Selma March, no Birmingham church bombing, and no George Wallace standing in the door with the pronouncement of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever, virtually every northern city at one time or another has had its share of racial killings and cross burnings and uh, white riots. And there's no mention of this segregation or these instances in the North a lot of time throughout history. This is an image of the New England Bulletin of 1949 and it celebrates the agreement of Worth store owner Samuel Greenberg to hire African American women as sales clerks to advance locally. This is in Waterbury, Connecticut. Sean Lay Alexander, the author of An Army of Lions, I believe we have the book here, The Civil Rights Struggle Before the NAACP, it tells us that in this period from the 1880s through the first decade of the 20th century, black organizations South and North, though understudied and underappreciated, laid the institutional, ideological, and political groundwork for the establishment of the NAACP, A, the NAACP, sorry in 1909. After the end of the Civil War 
and during radical reconstruction, African Americans in the South won elections to state legislators and to the U.S. Congress. Among the other achievements of Reconstruction were the South's first state-funded public school systems, more equitable taxation legislation, laws against racial discrimination in public transport, and accommodations and ambitious economic development programs, including aid to railroads and other enterprises. But Southern states concurrently passed laws called the Black Codes which were designed to limit black suffrage and representation and maintain a compliant workforce. The Ku Klux Klan and those who would come to be called Dixocrats in the next century organized often violently to roll back the gains of radical reconstruction. And in 1875, Democrats waged a violent campaign to take back Mississippi and the federal government refused to intervene. And then the federal level compromise of 1876 left the Democrats in control of the South, which basically marked the end of Reconstruction. This is the context which led, which key African American leaders nationally began to organize major civil rights organizations with both Southern and Northern chapters. They organized lawsuits. Uh, they organized delegations to government leaders and, and they wrote letters to campaigns to restore rights in the South and explain, expa expand them in the North. So while you had these black codes that was taking place in the South and basically the end of Reconstruction, in the North, on July 1902, in the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, it hosted the most important African-American political event of the year the annual meeting of the National Afro-American Council, otherwise known as the NAC, NAAC. The NAAC was active from 1898 to 1907, was one of the more successful experiments. It attracted many leading black citizens at the time, mostly in the North and border states. Here's a slide of that meeting being covered by the Appeal, a black newspaper based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Connecticut leaders were active and built organizations to carry out aid for the South and civil rights campaigns for our state. Another one of those organizations was the state Sumner League. The Sumner League in Connecticut was a black Republican club with nodes all over the state and was founded on August 22nd, 1894. The state Sumner League of Connecticut had thousands of members. The members who were in leadership played a major key role in key national efforts to fight lynching and the enactment of Jim Crow laws in the South. The League was also heavily involved with the effort to desegregate public accommodations in Connecticut. The purpose of the League was explained in the Journal and Courier on August 23rd, 1894, and it was explained as the improvement and advancement of the colored citizens of Connecticut to, end, to the end of healthy and material progress politically, socially, intellectually, and morally. And the organization specifically urged the full enjoyment of every civil right without distinction or an account of birth, race, or previous social status. On August 22, 1894, a fellow by the name of Joseph P. Peeker, who was a resident of New Haven, Connecticut, and about 200 Connecticut African-American leaders met at J.W. Stewart's Cafe, also described as a casino and a pavilion, at a place called Saving Rock, Saving Rock in West Haven, Connecticut. And at the time, this was a seaside resort that once rivaled Coney Island in New York. It was at this particular meeting the men formed a new organization for the betterment of the conditions of African-Americans. The New Haven Journal Carrier, we found uh, reprinted news stories from a black newspaper that no longer available, that's no longer available and called the Connecticut Banner. And the banner had about three dozen news accounts of the founding and ongoing work of the Connecticut Sumner League. Joseph Peeker was also a long-serving president of the Connecticut Sumner League and a bootleg, bootleg by trade. The newspaper reported him speaking at numerous regional and national civil rights conventions and assemblies. 
For example, it's reported in the National African American Newspapers that he was elected president of a colored convention in Boston in 1896. And in 1898, he was one of the big name speakers at a giant meeting at Cooper Union in New York City to denounce the Wilmington, North Carolina race riot, which is also known as the Wilmington Massacre of 1898. This particular riot occur occurred in Wilmington, North Carolina on November 10th. And basically what happened was that you had ex-Confederate soldiers burning down the black press in this town, burning the building down to the ground, and it caused a riot, which led to about 14 to 60, 60 African Americans losing their life. This is a clipping from the National Newspaper of Afro-American League, found in Chronicle America, enlisting Joseph Peeker and jo George A. Jenkins as the members of the National Executive Board from Connecticut. Connecticut was a key destination for African-American leaders campaigning around civil rights, just as Ida B. Wells toured to raise funds for anti-lynching campaigns. So a man by the name of John Mitchell Jr., who was the editor of the important black newspaper called the Richmond Planet from Richmond, Virginia, toured Connecticut also to raise funds for defense cases. And on March 26, 1897, he spoke in New Haven to a crowd of about 300 people on the outrages in the South and a case called the Lindbergh case. And it was recorded that people with the best hearts and minds of the city applauded him as he spoke for about one hour. His Connecticut tour was national news and well covered. And his own Richmond Planet back home in Richmond also covered the event. We would, he would continue to speak throughout the month of April all over Connecticut in defense of several cases of injustices that had taken place in the South. But he mainly talked about the Lunenburg prisoners, who were two black women who were falsely accused of murder in Virginia. Pictured are Mary, if you can see it, Mary Abernathy and Pokey Barnes, who were falsely accused, accused of murder in Virginia. In coverage of the tour, we hear about highly successful, prominent African-American leaders who hosted speakers from the end of the state to another. We learn of the Hartford home of Mr. and Mrs. William Shields and a magnificent feast to which prominent leaders traveled from outside the state. We learn of the fine team of horses driven by Booker Jones and the handsomely furnished home of Reverend A.C. Powell. We hear about the very well-off restauranteur and caterer J.W. Stewart, whose Saban Rock establishment hosted many leadership meetings of the Sumner League. We hear of the successful physicians and their accomplished children. So in short, we can come to understand the wealth and accomplishments of Connecticut African American leadership through the eyes of their peers through their country. Connecticut's Gilded Age African American leadership from blue blacks with great oratorial and organizational skills to businessmen and professionals clearly impressed the entire nation at that time. Despite their relative prosperity, education, and high culture, the African American community in Connecticut still faced segregation and accommodations as in the rest of the North. Now keep in mind, the big federal Civil Rights Act that came out of the Civil Rights, the Civil War era, the 1875 Civil Rights Bill, was overturned in 1883 by the U.S. Supreme Court. And this defeat unleashed a wave of Jim Crow legislation in the South, and also more confident segregation in public accommodations in the North. And the Connecticut legislature passed a state civil rights law in 1884, but it was obviously lacking in clout. So in 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson ruled that separate facilities could be equal, seriously weakening the fight for the segregation. So as in the other states, the black community here tried to put forth bills for state laws to forbid discrimination from at least 1905 forward. And then at that time, a weak public accommodations bill was passed in. <clears throat> 
Technically, Connecticut historian Stacy Close has written, separate but equal had been outlawed in the 1870s, but in reality it remained in place. So in 1917, they are still trying to get a bill introduced into the Connecticut State Senate to ban signs that say no African Americans wanted here. This bill was written to apply to inns, to taverns, hotels, restaurants, bath hours, barbershops, theaters, music halls, and public conveyances, and public transportation, and would have levied a penalty from $100 to $500. However, this bill did not make it out of the judiciary. Then, in the wake of heroic black service in World War I, activists from the faith community and legal profession, they tried again. This piece on the right recounts the testimony of J.L. Morgan, the son of a prominent cleric and seven times wounded in action in World War I, pleading for the desegregation of accommodations here in Connecticut. So what's in the bill? What was in the bill, rather? Um, here's an image of a list of conditions that the black community thought they needed. This also gives us a glimpse of what life was like here in Connecticut in 1919 for African Americans. They asked for the following things to be made equal. Things such as eating houses, stores, parks, ice cream parlors, soda fountains, drug stores, clinics, hospitals, motion picture houses, pool parlors, bowling alleys, kindergartens, primary and secondary schools, garages, and all public conveyances on land or water and train stations and terminals. The image on the right is of a prominent attorney and advocate of this bill. His name is George W. Crawford. This bill too did not make it out of the Judiciary Committee at the time. 1918 was also known to many as the Red Summer because of the number of anti-black riots that exploded around the country as black soldiers returned home in uniform. And at the same time, the NAACP and other organizations nationally were helping local chapters file legislation like this. By the 1940s, Connecticut would be out ahead in certain matter of legislation about discrimination. But all the newspaper accounts of public accommodations fights show the amount of sweat and blood that it took over many decades to get to that place. In the years between 1900 and the First World War was known as the Progressive Era because of many social reforms, one for consumers, labor, and so on. But the spirit of the era did not carry over into reforms for African Americans in the African American community. Urban historian and author of A Very Different Age, Americans of Progressive Era, Stephen J. Diner wrote, for African Americans, the last decades of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century seemed in many respects the worst of times. As Jim Crow depended in, depend, deepened in the South, the story of Reconstruction was being rewritten to justify a fast retreat from equality under the law. Novelists and playwrights were central to this effort, which uh, reached far into the North. Thomas Dixon, who wrote the play called The Klansman, was one of those writers, central to the effort to rewrite history and to paint African Americans as the villains of the Reconstruction period. Meanwhile in Connecticut, the African American community tried to minimize the damage of this famous play in, in a number of cities. They were full of fear because the play was the occasion of an anti-black riot and in years later they rallied against the notorious film based on the play called The Birth of a Nation. Here's a story from the Norwich Bulletin dated September 27th, 1909 that documents the extraordinary efforts of the clergy and other citizens to deal with the performances of that play. The voices of Norwich leadership of African American communities are recorded in this Norwich Bulletin account of the city hearings and on the request to cancel this provocative play, The Klansman. 
Reverend Cannon of Mount Calvary Baptist Church talked about the current friendly relations of white and Negroes during this short residence in Norwich. And he said he did not want to see it broken. He recalled that in other places, racist spokespeople sparked riots. A person by the name of Reverend McLean of Grace Memorial, he protested that the play shows the Negro as a dangerous element, which was not so. However, lawyers for the theater company took up the side of promoters for the Klansmen, and at the end, the city, at the end in the city of, of Norwich, they decided to show the play. And this is a clipping of an article from Norwich, Norwich Bulletin, dated September 25th, 1907. Um, on council hearings about the Dixon play. In 1910, an African-American by the name of Jack Johnson, known as the Galveston Giant, became the first African-American heavyweight champion, and he reigned from about 1908 to 1915. Jim Jeffries was a white boxer and was the former heavyweight champion who at that time had been retired for about five years and he was also out of shape but he decided to come out of retirement to fight Jack Johnson and this was hyped up to be called and as we've probably heard it before the fight of the century and the media jumped on board they instigated racist remarks about winning the title for whites and Jim Jeffries was called the great white hope he was even quoted as saying, I'm going into this fight to the sole purpose of proving that a white man is better than a Negro. However, on July 4th, 1910 in Reno, Nevada, Jack Johnson would defeat Jim Jeffries by knockout. And when the fight was over, the defeat of Jim Jeffries prompted deadly race riots throughout the country. And the death toll listed dozens of blacks and several whites. In the clashes between the whites and blacks, many others were injured and property was destroyed and demolished and burned. The fight, of course, was filmed and solicited to be shown in various theaters throughout the country. A year later, however, many of the same administrators and administrations who, who didn't want to stop the play the Klansmen from being shown here in the North were now persuaded to ban showing of the fight on film through their local theaters. Connecticut Governor Frank B. Weeks said that the showing of the film would be against public morals and urged cities and towns to prohibit film showings. Others in the black community felt different. Um, at the time, prize, prize fighting was illegal, as in most states, but it was illegal in Connecticut. And you could be punished by five years of imprisonment. So this was a method, method that the that the government would use to persuade theaters to not show this particular fight. Here's an article from the Norris Bulletin dated July 8, 1910 that talks about the views of Connecticut Governor Frank Weeks about how he was against public morals to show the fight. Vocal Connecticut American clerics argued that the motivation for banning the film was not moral at all, but only a fear that it would weaken the myth of white supremacy. And in their reaction, they were in accord with African-American newspaper editors around the country. The struggle for representation of African-Americans as leaders in sports and culture and education was an ongoing process. And this is an image of an article from the Bridgeport Evening Farmer dated July 11th, 1910. We have not yet digitized Connecticut dailies for the 1930s, so we don't have a lot to report on about the coverage of African-American communities. But we have some precious issues of African-American weeklies from the Hartford Chronicle family, newly digitized from 1940 to 1949, with almost all the issues from post-World War II period. The 1940s were full of effort and progress on civil rights in our state. The African American community was so influential that the state established the Interracial Commission in 1943, which was established to study problems of discrimination in, in all or specific fields of human relations, mainly dealing with employment. Together, the pursuing black press 
activists and African-American professionals, the CIO and other social justice organizations, the Interracial Commission won major victories, including the 1947 a State Fair Employment Practices Law forbidding discrimination by employers, employment agencies, or labor organizations. Above on the left, there's a case of a lunch counter discrimination against a reporter being converted and the victory won after engaging the State Interracial Commission. And on the right, an integrated group of Middletown High School students being entertained at the governor's office. And the state was trying to work with students to force the Board of Education to quit sending high school students to Washington, D.C. because black students were refused accommodations in hotels and restaurants. Special advisor to the Interracial Council, who is often reported as speaking to the community groups and local leaders on behalf of the state of Connecticut was Frank Simpson. The Interracial Council and black newspapers again collaborated to end discrimination in employment. These titles are full of first and seconds in Connecticut. You see an image of Henry W. Hayes, who was the second black bus driver hired by Connecticut company after a community-wide campaign led by a crusading black newspaper. The desegregation of the Connecticut National Guard was hailed as a major victory across the African-American community. The black press encouraged it and insisted on full implementation. These are a few clippings that give a sense of the drama of the early civil rights movement in our state. As a conclusion, I would like to tell you what digitization of history Connecticut papers and plant, placing them alongside African American titles like the Richmond Planet in Chronicle America by quoting Mark Schenkel, the grandson of the editor of the Hartford Chronicle who contacted us in April. Um, he said, so far I have focused on what the paper can contribute to our knowledge of social history, just recently we learned what it can mean for our family history. Mark Shankel saw the AP story on the Hartford Chronicle and knew only that his grandfather had been the editor at one time. Above you see, you can see a picture from the Chronicle of, of James Shankel, still then a reporter with leaders of the National Negro Congress and the CIO organizations from Winchester Arms in 1946. And on the right, a photo sent by his grandson of his great-grandfather's church in Hartford, Connecticut. Mark Schenkel, he wrote a letter to us um, about the newspapers and about some of the things that he was able to discover. He said that so far, I found information on all my grandparents up to my great-great-grandparents on both sides of the family from 1890 to the 18, 1960s through obituaries, church public announcements, commercial shows, and etc., I've been able to identify and delve into the history of many of my ancestors. Both my mother's father and grandfather were ministers in the early 1900s. I found information on my maternal grand, grand and great-grandfathers, as well as Reverend E. Elias Jackson, also known as Reverend E.E. E. Jackson, 1890 to 1930s, and Reverend Emmon Carter Thompson, also known as Reverend E.C. Thompson, uh, 1890 to 1917. These two post-abolitionist evangelists from Virginia were pioneers who helped establish several churches and conventions in New England, New Jersey, and elsewhere. Their information can be found in the North Bulletin, the Daily Dispatch, the Morning Journal, and the Courier, and the Richmond Planet. We hope that Mark Schenkel is not the last to deepen our understanding of the story of, of African-American uh, community in Connecticut through newspapers digitized by the CT Digital Newspaper Project. And we encourage you all to do your part as well. Um, I can, can say that I found something really interesting by using um, Chronicling America. I was looking and I wanted to find some information about my great, great grandfather whom I never knew. Only thing I knew was his name. And I had an idea that he died from a car accident. And I was able to look in Chronicle America, 
and looked through the Richmond Planet and I was able to pull up the article that described the accident, where it took place, and how he died. And that was amazing. Uh, for the first time, I had some connection to my, my great-grandfather. But um, it's a great resource, and we want to encourage everyone to use it. Thank you.